it's a great pleasure to, for me, to um, be able to introduce Dr. Lloyd Cetera, who is the Chief Medical Officer for the New York State Office of Mental Health, which is the nation's largest state mental health agency. Hmm, what does that say about mental health in New York? Hmm. He's also an adjunct professor of Columbia Mailman School of Public Health, contributing writer for Psychology Today and the New York Daily News, amongst other publications. He served as the Mental Health Commissioner for New York City, the Medical Director and Executive Vice President for Harvard's McLean Hospital, as Director of Clinical Services for the American Psychiatric Association, and he's written hundreds of articles on mental health, the addictions, um, and, and many book, film, TV, and theater reviews, and has published a dozen books. And I think what, what is most critical for many of us in primary care is that he writes for um, lay audiences as well as professional audiences. So the information that rarely gets out to the public about these things um, is, 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 is definitely assisted by all of um, Dr. Shetterer's works. He appears regularly on radio and television, and we have copies of his book on addic the addiction solution, um, which are for sale at a huge discount in the back of the room. And um, please welcome Lloyd Cetera, thanks. Good morning. Can you hear me? I thank you, Dr. Kelman, Dr. Khan, and many colleagues. It's a great privilege to be here. I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a public health doctor. And over the years, I've become a medical journalist. And the talk today is derived principally uh, from this uh, book that came out uh, almost a month ago uh, on addiction about uh, the opioid and other drug <clears throat> epidemic in this country. And as Dr. Kalman said, it is written for a general educated lay audience, but it does mean to uh, point the way for clinicians and policymakers as well. And I think you'll see that merger, I hope you will see that merger in the talk today. The, the, uh, my talk will have three parts. The first part will be about what we're currently doing that's not working. The second part will be about taking a moment to see how we humans are active ingredients in the experience of uh, taking a drug. And then the third part will be about the solutions which we have, which we're not hardly using. So where are we? I like quotes, uh, <laughs> Churchill's quote, which is, you can always count on Americans to do the right thing after they've tried everything else. And it seems as if we continue to be trying to do everything else, and uh, it's not working for us. The everything else that uh, isn't working, I think, falls into two categories. One are control strategies, and the other are what might be called consequences or scare tactics. Perhaps the uh, biggest historical example of uh, evidence of the failed approach to try to control people's access to what they want, what gives uh, them pleasure, is prohibition. Remember that? This country decided it was going to interfere with access to alcohol for the entire population of this country. And the only enduring effect from prohibition is organized crime. Organized crime was kind of modest before then, and it put organized crime on the map. And I think that's a, a, a good story about how when you try to re repress, control, push down access to what people want, they get it, but just they get it from generally illegal means. And, and uh, the war on drugs, and I'll say a little bit about that, uh, but, but the uh, overall results of our efforts to try to control people's access to psychoactive substances to what gives them pleasure or relief is captured by this headline, uh, the, which is uh, in the onion which is a satirical newspaper, and in fact, uh, that seems to be the 
uh, the report again and again as to uh, how we're doing with the drug war. Nixon coined the term the war on drugs. And it was a, a war. I don't know how you make war on drugs, but you know, he made sure that crops were burned, borders were uh, tried to be secure, and enforcement, heavy hand of enforcement, became the approach. Uh, and I bring that up because it may uh, resonate or may make you uh, think, uh, boy, that sounds a little bit like what's going on in Washington at the moment. The effects of the draw on, uh, war on drugs are not, um, uh, they're not innocent. This, you might think this is a, a photo of our soldiers abroad storming some insurgent compound. This is local police uh, storming uh, a drug dealer's home. And in the war on drugs, uh, the more uh, the uh, drug dealers, who are usually people with addictions, uh, are under siege, they arm themselves increase, with increasingly powerful armament and police respond as well. Where do they get this kind of armament? How does the local police department equip itself so amazingly with uh, these vests, these high power guns, uh, Hummers? They get them free from the federal government. The federal government has an expiration date, usually five years on its equipment. And after those five years, police, local police are free to uh, take it. And that's what's happening here and in this incident. Uh, and others as well. The effects are, are not just deadly uh, for the person uh, who is allegedly selling drugs, but police are now getting shot and killed. War on drugs. Another effect, very extraordinary in this country over the years, since Reagan and particularly Reagan, is locking up people uh, for uh, drug offenses. There are over two million people in this country in prison. We have the highest rate of imprisonment in the world. And of those people, they're principally there for nonviolent drug crimes. And of course, the hammer of enforcement falls disproportionately on poor people and people of color. If you look at who's in prison, they're the ones that are uh, most affected by this. So there's a type of implicit racism if you will, on the war on drugs. And, and Nixon actually was quite specific about that when, when it was revealed. The other principal approach that we're fond of is scare tactics. And this is a, a two posters from a while ago that uh, could be uh, circulated by the current attorney general, namely you know, marijuana, is the smoke of hell, devil's harvest, it's gonna ruin your children. The irony of these scare tactics, particularly when they're focused on youth, is uh, the, that they have a paradoxical effect. Have any of you heard of what was called the D.A.R.E. program? Yeah, so that was a scare tactic program of sending men in blue into schools, <clears throat> sometimes dragging along, along a convicted felon to scare youth into not using drugs. But the teenage brain is wired for risk and adventure. I mean, it's a survival to think. Think 50,000, 100,000 years ago, uh, a family need, needed to have uh, the youth leave the home, search for new sources of food, find a mate. So adventure risk, this is hardwired in the brain, and if you entice uh, a youth, as these uh, campaigns do, you're just going to get their interest and uh, they're going to leave home for it. So those are the two principal strategies that we're uh, still enamored with, and they've had a renaissance in, in this uh, administration uh, uh, with, uh, you know, let's arrest uh, uh, people within states that have legal marijuana, maximum sentences, execute drug dealers. Uh, we're, we're lose, we've lost some ground here. Second part, so, and, and what's so tragic about that is that it doesn't, all that doesn't work and it's hugely expensive and it keeps us from doing the right thing. 
So the second part, I want to touch on how we humans are active ingredients in our experience in our use of uh, psychoactive drugs, whether it's cannabis, poppy, alcohol, tobacco, <clears throat> it doesn't matter. But if we just are myopically focused on the drug, we will miss the forest uh, of experience. And there are a number of factors, and this is one of the chapters in the book. What are the factors that matter with a drug? I'll give you some examples. Who is this? Billie Holiday. She was born, her mother was a prostitute uh, in Baltimore. She grew up on the streets of Baltimore. And at 10, she was raped. Her screams brought the local police. And they took her to be a prostitute and arrested her. And she spent the year in juvenile detention. After she was released from that, she traipsed around, followed her mother, came here to New York. Her mother was working at a brothel in Harlem. Her mother refused to take her in, and she went on the streets herself, became a prostitute. And soon she too was arrested again for prostitution and went and was uh, incarcerated at Shelter Island, a predecessor to what's now Rikers Island. And when she got out of jail, the first thing that she wanted to do was to get psychically, emotionally, as far away from her inner experience called set, the interior that we bring to a drug experience. Neglect, abuse, rape, incarceration. This was her internal experience, and she was going to get the hell away from it, first with high-proof alcohol, and very soon with heroin. She tried to make a living uh, legally, she tried to be a dancer. She wasn't a very good dancer, but boy, could she carry a tune. And she became the incredible songstress that she was and took heroin with her on that trip. And she died at age 44 of cirrhosis of the liver. That's the interior. That's somebody whose experience of uh, uh, a drug is about her own need to escape her interior. Today, we think about this as adverse childhood experiences, right? Abuse, neglect, domestic violence, rape, um, foster care, incarceration, adverse childhood experiences. And that's a public policy that we have yet to achieve in this state. We are doing depression screening. We are starting to do more substance screening and intervention. But what we're not yet at is identifying these traumas in children, three, four, five, in schools and in medical settings, and intervening with their families. Because if a child has these experiences, like Billie Holiday, by the time they're a teenager, they have multiple physical problems, diabetes, asthma, obesity. They're uh, smoking, they're using drugs, they're in trouble with the law. This is how trauma hardwires the brain, and we have, we, ha we have effective programs. Some of them are really terrific, model, uh, modeled here in New York City, adverse childhood experiences. So if we have an interior, we have an ex exterior. And some of you who have had uh, um, experience in the addictions will we'll know here I'm stealing set and setting from Norm Zinberg. And, um, and so setting is the context in which drugs are used. And this is a picture from 1971, the Vietnam War. Department of Defense got wind of the fact that American soldiers were heavily using high potency, cheap heroin that uh, combat soldiers in the jungles. And they asked a Harvard professor, a drug expert, Norm Zinberg, to go to Vietnam and report back on two things. What's the prevalence? And are these soldiers going to bring back their heroin addiction to the United States, potentially doubling the population of heroin users in this country? So Zinberg went. He went with the epidemiologist, Eli Robbins. And he said one in five soldiers we're using heroin three to seven days a week, one in five. 
But he predicted that that percentage wouldn't be the percentage, the prevalence upon their return. And he was kind of right. It fell from 20% to 12%. And one soldier described his use of heroin as a way to make time go away. So here were men at that time in a jungle setting with an enemy that they, didn't, they couldn't identify, that their lives were at stake every day in a war that was unpopular in this country. That was the setting. That's what fostered that degree of heroin use setting. Another example also uh, that I uh, lived through in the early 60s, LSD became very popular as a counterculture drug. And emergency rooms, your emergency room, other emergency rooms here in New York City, started to have a regular flow of young people on bad trips, really anxious or psychotic. And they would get some medicine, they would be discharged. And two or three years later, all those admissions, all those bad trips to EDs stopped. No change in the drug. No change in the dose, 100 micrograms, 150, 200, whatever. It was that the community understood that the setting in which LSD needs to be taken to protect the person involves briefing them, letting them know often that the first wall that they're going to encounter on the trip is, is terror. They've got to get through that. They need a guide. They need a setting where they don't believe the cops are going to show up. And with that, Bad trips stopped. Setting. Age is a huge factor in drugs, particularly with the one that is uh, uh, so uh, uh, exploding in this country, cannabis. It makes a really big difference if somebody starts smoking when they're 12, when they're 20, or when they're 25. And that's because our brains are under construction. Uh, and this is a graphic of the myelinization. The, uh, the maturation of our brain. And when a brain is exposed to high potency THC, and the THC that's around now is 60 times more potent than the stuff I smoked when I was in college and medical school. So you have a vulnerable brain under construction and a particularly vulnerable brain with kids who have a family history of mental disorders or who are already showing emotional problems. So. This is about the strategy of not yet. What, if, what do parents do because this drug is ubiquitous? Uh, their one approach is put it off as long as possible because your brain's under construction. What's the fastest route of administration of a drug to the brain? Inhalation. You'd think it might be injection, but just think about your anatomy. You put some substance into your vein, it has to traverse up to your heart, pass from one chamber of your heart to the other, <clears throat> go to your lungs and go up to your brain. That's an injection. But if you inhale, the substance goes immediately to the lungs and the, the faster the route of administration to a brain, the more addicting a substance is. And this explains the uh, distinctions between chewing coca leaves, between cocaine and crack, which became an epidemic. And some people think that tobacco, cigarettes, are as addictive as they are because of inhalation, because of how immediately and powerfully nicotine gets to the brain. So these are all factors. There are others that we have to think about in terms of if we're going to succeed with individuals and policy. One of them I want to touch on because it bothers me a lot in this state and in other states, and that's the composition of the plant. So cannabis has about 100 cannabinoids, THC being the principal one, that's what gets us high. And then another one in natural plants, uh, naturally grown plants, is CBD, cannabidiol. Well, cannabidiol has no psychoactive effects. In fact, it's neuroprotective. But the, tea, but the cannabis that's grown now used to be about five feet high. Now it's about 18 inches, 60 times more potent, and genetically bred often to get rid of the CBD. 
Any of you been to a marijuana dispensary? Oh, you have to go to one of these. Absolutely. It's, imagine like uh, the world's best liquor store on, on steroids. They are really adventures. Uh, you, you have to, en you enter, you have, first of all, they take your driver's license and record. So if you're uncomfortable with that, you won't do that. And then you get routed down this uh, um, narrow uh, area and standing in front of you is a heavily armed man with a Kevlar vest. So that you have to get through those two. Uh, and then the reason for that is it's a cash business. None of these uh, dispensaries can take uh, credit because credit comes from national banks and remember marijuana is a illegal drug federal, federally. So, but once you get in, there's this menu of the different stuff that you can buy. And uh, it's all done with the iPads and highly informed salespeople. And you discover that you can buy almost pure THC. You can buy stuff without CBD. And, in, and that's true in the medical marijuana dispensaries as well. And I think that's a really bad mistake because it's, this is a harm reduction uh, strategy. If, if uh, when, when my son smokes marijuana, I want him to buy marijuana that has 20 or 30% CBD. I want him to have some neuroprotection, and, and that's a public health position that we have not come to. Uh, so the factors that influence our um, use of a drug, how we're an active ingredient in the drug. And then last the section on solutions. And so I, you know, I am a public health doctor over the years. I've learned an approach. And in this case, this is, uh, we've beaten back so many epidemics in, in this country and around the world. Think of uh, polio, think of smallpox, think of a variety of ways by which sanitation, uh, clean water, clean air have changed the health of vast populations. Think of the way that we've pushed back, dramatically reduced tobacco use. These are public health campaigns and they're, um, and this one, for addiction, I think is about prevention, screening and early intervention, and good treatment. So prevention is, of course, everybody's most desired goal. Keep a youth from uh, um, using or abusing substances. And there are well-studied programs about how to do that, that can be adopted, that families can be trained on. One of my favorites is called Life Skills Training. And it's a skill-based program. Elementary, middle uh, school. Children uh, have a limited capacity for decision-making, but they can be trained in decision-making. It's a cognitive training. So that a child, when offered a joint, at one o'clock in the afternoon can think through, hmm, do I want to smoke this? I have practice afterwards. Am I, it's going, is it going to affect my scoring? That's decision making. And uh, that, uh, this, this, this program also works to help kids modulate their feelings, which are bounce around, control their impulses. This is a skill-based program. It's nothing guarantees that kids will not use, but this is a powerful, protective set of skills that we can give to youth. Another program, low tech, low cost, this big brother, big sister. Someone, a youth who uh, starts to spend time, is cared for by an older youth from their same background who's making a life. This is very protective. So these are low tech, prevention, public health interventions that uh, are sadly hardly used. If you're going to do prevention with youth, you want to do prevention with families. And yes. I, I don't know if any of you uh, were born uh, skilled parents. I certainly wasn't. We have to learn how to be parents, and we can be taught. That's what these programs do. So I. You know, I remember with my 
son. I was really tough on that young guy and pushed him and demanded, and boy, that was really the wrong form of parenting. And he taught me that there was a better way. And this has become uh, termed now positive parenting, looking for every opportunity to support, to reinforce what a youth is doing and biting your tongue when you want to say, you know, what are you doing sleeping till noon, et cetera, et cetera. Because when we come down on kids, we drive them away. And when we are positive, we bring them in, and that's protective. Spending time with your children. When Obama was president and he was in the White House, every day he would have dinner at 6.30 in the evening with his two daughters and his wife. No texting, no TV. This was about being a family. These are protective ways by which we can uh, help kids not progress to abuse and dependence. So here I want to give you a little bit of a tour, a brief tour of the brain. Because this is not, I'm not a neuroscientist, and in fact, this is what I hope you will download. You can get it from the National Neuroscience Curriculum in Initiative online. It's free. And you can print out as many copies. And when you sit down with a family or with a person who has an addiction, and you're trying to help them understand this is a bad disease, things are going on in the brain, and that the more areas of the brain that we intervene in, the much more likely your loved one or you is going to have a chance. So here, um, ventral tegmental area, orbital frontal cortex. Oh, wait, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, or a ventral tegmental area, nucleus accumbens. These are thought to be the reward centers of our brain. This is where we have the dopamine spike that gets us going. This is the pleasure center. And normally it's incited by a loving touch, a beautiful rainbow, work well done, except when someone starts to habituate to psychoactive drugs, like opioids. Then the reward center wants only one thing, and that's, what the, and that's the drug, and that's what Nora Volpa called the, how the brain is pirated away. So if you're explaining to somebody, you know, you've got a gas pedal here going that, um, that we can help you with. We have medications. This is the site where medications work. And I'll come back to those. We have three FDA-approved medications. So when you're building a, a good treatment plan and explaining, you want people to understand that. Then you want them to understand there's another section of the brain, oral frontal cortex. And this is what we, where we believe uh, motivation resides. It's about having uh, an experience and wanting more of it. This is what gets us going. This is where motivation lives. And that's another site of intervention. How many of you have been trained in motivational interviewing? Oh, that's great. Um, you know, and I think it's a reflection of the leadership that you have here. And uh, I, I don't think if this was a purely psychiatric audience, uh, we would have that kind of response. But uh, Neil's probably seen this. Uh, video where a mother, about 29, walks into her pediatrician's office with her six-year-old son. He's got a, recurrent, a recurrence of ear infections. He's been there a while. Sits down in the consulting room with the pediatrician, and she gives the mom a prescription. And then she starts to say, don't you know, I see here you're a smoker. Don't you know that secondhand smoke is making your kids sick? Don't you know your smoking is dangerous to your child and that's why you're here? That's not motivational interviewing. What motivational interviewing is her giving the mother a prescription and saying, uh, tell me a little bit about yourself. Oh, I see, you're, you have to work, you're a single mom. You have coverage problems, take care of your kid. You come home, you're all stressed out, you're doing your best. 
and I see here you smoke cigarettes. They must be helping you. They must be doing something for you. That's motivational interviewing because it is about getting behind, getting a, uh, a beside and behind a person so that that mom can say, well, wait a minute, doc. I'm not sure I want to smoke, rather than the doctor scolding her and she's squirming and ready to get out. So motivational interviewing, that's what we can do here. Then we have the prefrontal cortex. If we have any break uh, to uh, quiet the accelerator pedal, it's the prefrontal cortex. That's where reasoning and judgment sometimes <laughs> reside. And these are augmented, uh, these, these uh, prefrontal uh, functions are augmented uh, by support, by support groups. They're also enhanced by certain cognitive techniques. So, we, so we're building a case here for medications, for motivational interviewing, for support groups, and then finally the amygdala and the hippocampus. This is where we believe memory is encoded. And memory is not eidetic. Memory is an emotional experience that is uh, encoded with some type of visual, some type of smell, some type of taste. And this is uh, critical to understanding relapse. Addiction is a chronic relapsing disease. And relapse is with, by a trigger. So remember Pavlov's dogs. Pavlov trained the dogs to salivate to the bell, not to the food. This is a condition response. Same thing with a person who is addicted. They, a friend calls and she's high, trigger. Walks in a neighborhood, there's a drug deal going on, trigger. Prince dies, trigger. And uh, it's not the death, it's the drug, it's the condition response. And this area is particularly amenable to cognitive intervention around uh, recognizing triggers and helping people control their triggers. So good treatment, which is really hard to find, is about educating, I think, families and people with addiction that we have treatments, but if we just rely on NA or if we just give them a prescription for buprenorphine, we are not going to equip them because this is a bad disease. Two related concepts, both Latin. Similia similibus curantur, first. Like cures like. And this is the foundation of AA in the 30s. A person with alcohol addiction in, uh, who's clean and dry is the person to cure somebody who's actively drinking. Like cures like. And that was the start and still remains a central premise, but it has also become the basis of what is called peer treatment now in mental health and addictions. It's when you want to engage and retain people in complex treatment, it's simile a simile of a The other is a pun, uh, and this was in a letter that Carl Jung wrote to Bill Wilson, who was one of the co-founders of Alcoholics Anonymous. Spiritus contra spiritum. And he said, a spiritual life is what's necessary to counter spiritum, to counter alcohol. And that became the ethos of AA. You need to discover a higher power. It doesn't have to be a religion, but you need to understand that you're part of a bigger and more powerful world, and you'll stand a better chance. We don't tend to ask people, you know, tell me about yourself. Do you believe, what do you believe in? Do you have a spiritual life? Do you have faith? These are essential uh, to um, uh, meeting people where they are and fostering what is a natural ingredient in recovery. We have three types of FDA approved medication, medication assisted treatment. That, the agonists are methadone and buprenorphine. Methadone is back from the early 60s. A lot of people uh, who have heroin addiction, even uh, opioid pain pill medication, they don't like methadone. It's sedating, a lot of side effects, and a person has to go every day 
and have directly observed treatment, then it feels quite uh, shaming and uh, stigmatizing. Uh, there's a huge gap between the number of people with these problems and the use of methadone. And then in 2002, out came buprenorphine. And I was working as a mental health commissioner here in the city, and we made that a signature issue to try to introduce the provision of buprenorphine. And I knew uh, four years earlier, 1998, in France, uh, buprenorphine was released as a drug without any training, with a, the nonsense eight hours. If that is really, have any of you taken this training? It's really boring. Um, I mean, <laughs> maybe an hour would do it. Um, and then you have to have a federal waiver. This is a huge barrier. In France, they just released it, and overdose deaths dropped 80% in two to three years in France. And that was what was in the back of my head and my colleagues in terms of trying to advance buprenorphine in this country. And we've made very little progress. That we have very few doctors who have the waiver and even among those who, who prescribe. And this is a life-saving drug. It's really hard to get off of. It's not um, that it doesn't have its uh, you know, downside, because it does. Uh, and I, I don't know, does your emergency room ever give somebody who you've, uh, who's arrived in, with an overdose and, and who's been um, uh, given Narcan, uh, ever give them several days of buprenorphine? Yeah. Because think about it, if, if you, and, and I, I pack Narcan now, you know, it's not you don't have to uh, auto inject, you have nasal spray you have kits in, in New York State. You don't have to be a doctor to buy this. You can go into most any pharmacy. Uh, but this and I went in not as a doctor. Um, and it did cost me 40 bucks as my copay. But one of these days I'm going to come upon somebody, you know, sitting in a car slumped over or locked in a, a Starbucks bathroom to having shot up and not, and not freeing up the bathroom. This is gonna happen. So, so we have buprenorphine, and, and the reason for buprenorphine is when we give somebody Narcan in the emergency room, we put them immediately into withdrawal. They feel awful, they're drug sick. So what do they wanna do? They wanna go and get a fix, that's the first thing. So we're not covering them. Even giving them a few days still leaves them exposed to where are they going to get maintenance from. But if your emergency room doctors are hating their patients with overdoses, they know they're going to be back in a day or two. They can forestall, they can delay their return, but with some buprenorphine and maybe engage them in treatment. So we have antagonist, naloxone, which is just it's a lifesaver. And then the other drug, which made its case a uh, built-in science case uh, is uh, uh, naltrexone, Vivitrol, a uh, 28-day injectable. And also not very popular. I mean, this is an antagonist. This prevents the reward centers from uh, firing up. So people are essentially uh, deconditioned because they may use a reward um, drug and they're not gonna have the effect. Uh, and it's a big needle. Have any of you given this? Yeah, it's a big needle, it's painful. You have this like viscous stuff that, so the technology needs to come along a little bit, but it is a nuts. So we have three FDA approved drugs. These are essential, these are the, one of the mainstays of keeping people alive and helping people make lives, particularly with opioid addiction. So I wanna just touch on uh, a couple more points and then finish up. <coughs> that, um, because we're human. I mean, I, well, the premise of my book is that people use drugs because they're effective. They work, they relieve physical pain, they relieve psychic pain, they transport us away from the grind of everyday life. There isn't one culture anywhere on the globe that doesn't use intoxicants. Not one. This is perhaps, uh, some people say, as much of a basic human need as is hunger or attachment. So we need other approaches that uh, offer people alternatives, prevention, you know, exercise, sports, 
mind-body activities, etc. But the one I want to talk about is one that most people think is counterintuitive, and that's yet another drug to treat addiction, and that's psilocybin. So, uh, some of you followed the research on psilocybin? Yeah. This is really promising. 500 people already administered synthetic psilocybin at, in four August medical centers, Imperial College of London, NYU, Hopkins, Stanford, and the first cohort were people who were facing imminent death. They were in extreme distress, anxious about their, uh, the imminence of their death, and they were given one trip, occasionally two. And so the trip lasts four to six hours, but 80% of these individuals went from this state of existential horror to being reconciled with their death, really reconciled with their life. And that's not just during the drug, um, active drug time, that's for months after. And something's happened in the brain that has enabled somebody to experience, like uh, we did as a child, the wonder, the con connectedness, the continuity that uh, helps us realize that death is just a moment in time. And this is now being studied with addiction, with tobacco, opioids, depression, OCD. Not one bad reaction. And we don't have a single drug that is a one-time administration for addiction or for depression, bad depression or OCD. Maybe uh, this or some derivative of it is the answer, an answer. The last I want to talk about implicit bias, because that's us. And, one, and, and it's exemplified, I think, by how little buprenorphine is prescribed. Mostly, doctors don't want addicts in their office. And if you prescribe buprenorphine, you're going to get addicts in your office, as if you didn't have addicts in your office. But this is, um, this is about our own implicit bias. So we would say, oh, no, no, it's a disease. These are people. But we don't act that way. We act as if there's something wrong with them, and they're going to essentially contaminate our offices. Um, this is a chronic disease, a chronic relapsing disease. And we, uh, people are biased, and people hate themselves for their addiction. They don't need us to add to that. So here's the shameless end. The, this, uh, these, if you like stories, if you like history, uh, science, uh, that's what this book is full of. And uh, it is meant to try to uh, say that we have solutions, that we have reason to uh, be hopeful we can beat this epidemic, uh, and we have ways to do that. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lloyd. You know, it's, uh, it's clear why you've been so successful at getting your message out to the public, because this is not um, your average run-of-the-mill addiction talk. And, um, <laughs> I'm not sure what that means. And, well, I, because it's, it's, you know, it's so clearly oriented towards the kinds of things people in primary care and people sort of on the front lines need to know and do. Um, I was in a meeting upstate, and I'll, I won't tell you publicly, but I'll tell you later, mm -hmm. in one of the counties where I asked whether or not these naloxone kits, which are widely available in New York City, um, why, why in this meeting on dealing with addiction in the community, nobody even mentioned that the kits were there. And so afterwards, I went up to the mental health commissioner for the county and asked if they had these kits. And she said, yes, they're in uh, a box in the other room. And I said, well, why don't you give them out here? These are all people who are concerned. She said, well, you ha we're told by the state we have to have a four-hour course in order to be able to, to get <laughs> one of these kits. She said, well, either everybody in New York City is doing it illegally or you're wrong. Um, but I think, the word needs, I think the word needs to get out. Even in the city, people are worried about making lists of who they give them to, and, yeah. um, and yet it's, so, it's, it's such a powerful 
opportunity for people to do something good in the community. And we do have good Samaritan laws, and we have to be, I shouldn't say this as a government official, sometimes we just have to do what's in the patient's interest. Uh, but um, the, I was talking with the head of a drug treatment program the other day, and he said now, uh, when these are dispensed, this is still a crime scene. And if the police are called, so you may, uh, you may uh, give somebody an antidote, but usually you call 911, and 911 calls the police, and it becomes a crime scene because it's an illegal drug that they're using. And that, uh, that has become, in New York City, a deterrent to carrying uh, an Narcan and using it on the streets in the, in the South Bronx, in Brooklyn, where we have epicenters, uh, significant epicenters of heroin and heroin mix, mixed with fentanyl. So this is about um, uh, crazy, these are crazy ideas. These, you know, as if we can, no really good police uh, official that I've ever met thinks we can arrest ourselves out of the drug epidemic. You, this is a, um, that's a supply side approach. And what we have to get to and what I'm, uh, uh, offering here is a demand side. That as long as people demand drugs, they're going to get it. It's so profitable. It's so easy now to do this. Uh, you know, the fentanyl comes in uh, through the United States Postal Office from China, from labs in China. Did you know that? Because it takes so little. A couple grains of fentanyl would kill us all in this room. So you just line some doll or some toy or some book with fentanyl. You put it in the U.S. mail. It comes to your port here. And, you know, a half a salt shaker, a salt shaker of that stuff is, uh, is worth, you know, it might be worth paid $5,000 or $10,000 at uh, the first point of distribution, but it has a street value 50, 100, 1,000 times more. Uh, control strategies are uh, fiction, uh, they're a dream, and so, but thank you. So, yeah, we, this is about implicit bias. This is about our, um, thinking that uh, there's something the matter with these people or we're going to get in trouble with the cops. And, and some of the latter is true. Thank you. This is great. I, I think your approach to this being a public health problem is, is really helpful. And, you know, just thinking even about the cholera epidemic in London and Jon Snow is sort of how uh, our role as physicians, as educators, can, can, it seems that there's, you know, whether it's tuberculosis or these other public health initiatives, uh, we've abrogated our role around this. And I'm just wondering what your suggestions would be, you know, where n a number of us in this room are involved in education. And, and it's, it is just curious, the lack of initiative within our uh, educational institutions, medical institutions, nursing institutions, that, um, we're stuck with our implicit bias around this. We don't, not only don't we, we don't, we don't want to see these people in our facilities, we don't even want to educate our colleagues about this issue. I'm just sort of curious if you've heard of any innovative uh, attempts around education and your sort of thoughts on the... Yeah, the, uh, the this is such an important point and I, I don't have any magic solutions. What I've learned in terms of uh, bias or anti-stigma is public service messages don't do beans. That uh, what works is face-to-face -face contact. What works is when your cousin is an addict, when your spouse is uh, using uh, eight or 10 Oxycontin a day, when you realize there's a human being here with a disease, and, uh, you know, not, and that is, of course, tragic and uh, often um, overwhelming uh, and inspires all kinds of resentment as well because people who are in addiction, uh, they lie, they steal, they betray. So that's, that's part of the disease, but the, the best uh, program or the best interventions have to do with spending time and realizing there's a human being there 
who is struggling. And learning also that the time that the, I've discovered that the time the greatest support is needed from friends and family is when somebody relapses. Because they are demoralized, they don't think that they can return to uh, recovery. Doctors and clinicians get demoralized. Oh my God, he relapsed again. Family. Those are the moments where we have to help keep hope alive. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege to be here.